So what you saw uh, by looking at these maps was a history of of persistent unified statehood in the case of France. And um, obviously the origins are mixed. You have uh, first the Gauls and Romans, you know, uh, then uh, Germanic tribes. We talked about that Charlemagne, all this, and the formation in the Middle Ages of a strong kingship, and that persists to the French Revolution. We talked about how the feudal system was transformed into the modern state in the French Revolution. I'm not going to spend some time on that. Since the revolution, uh, since uh, 1800, basically, what's, what's, what's interesting uh, and uh, amusing in a way is that France has had three monarchies, five republics, two empires, and one neo-fascist regime. So, but the state has remained the same. So what do you see? You see an, a tradition of centuries long tradition of a strong centralized state, reinforced by the revolution, which wipes away the previous regime, but through the, through the help of what? A strong centralized state. So basically, the new reality that removed the old, uh, you know, absolute monarch uh, Louis XV establishes what a strong centralized state, and even more powerful than the previous one. We talked about this when we talked about the, the formation of the modern nation state. So uh, in the 19th century, you have the French Second Republic that's between 1848 and 1852, very short, followed by an empire. It means that there were different political systems. A republic was obviously based on elections, an empire was obviously an empire. French Third Republic was the longest lasting one up to this point. It lasted from 1871 to 1940. Well, why 1940? World War II, of course. It was, again, a representative democracy, but more on the model of, uh, well, let's not go into that for now. Notice that this is the republic that has survived the war, World War I successfully. World War I in which uh, one million people died only in France. One million, right? S uh, about two million were, uh, uh, well, two million in total were killed or crippled. I mean, these are more than, you know, uh, the U.S. has lost in all the wars ever. So this is just in one conflict, in one place, in one time. So just understand, and the war where was World War II fought at the Western Front in France. So understand the impact of these these you know cataclysms and you know continuously warfare warfare which is in your home in your house is bombed you know and that's a different memory right than some wars fought elsewhere and it gives you a sense of why these countries will take a path an opposite path with the after World War II with the European Union for example World War II obviously occupied France uh, a major figure in World War II when France was occupied by Nazi Germany. <coughs> Half occupied and half was a quasi-independent, but it was actually a puppet state run by the Nazis, or controlled by the Nazis. But a key figure was the movement of resistance, of opposition to the Nazis, but also the General de Gaulle, who was uh, abroad and was organizing troops and having radio speeches like Churchill for the, the Brits, uh, de Gaulle was for the French, and he became this hero. And when he returned after World War II, he obviously wanted to, you know, become the leader of France. But he was not. He did not become the leader because they established a new political system, Fourth Republic. This is why they're called First, Second, Third, Fourth Republic, because <coughs> a new republican system is established, a new political system is established within the same state, which is France. The republic, in this sense, means a different political system. France is the same. So an all-powerful, um, how did this Fourth Republic look like, which was established after World War II in 1946, was a sort of a parliamentary regime, like we saw in uh, Britain, only that not, it didn't have two parties like uh, the, in Britain, it had many parties, and that was the problem. But what was going on after World War II? Well, France has been a colonial power just like Britain, obviously they had had colonies here, right, Louisiana. Um, and all over the globe, Africa, Asia, and so on. After World War II, just like with Britain, France also loses its colonies. What was different, however, between France and Britain was that France, for France, colonies were not just some territories that we use for economic purposes. M many of them were actually considered to be France itself. You see here the difference in conception, the fact that Fran France is a unitary centralized state. So any territory it has, it is part of France itself. And this, this, uh, this border, and you see how it's politically determined, because you draw the border as you want. Um, 
so that, that meant that even those that, that the territories that were closest to France, for example Algeria, which is just across from the Mediterranean to the south, right, North Africa, that, that was a territory where French have been, li have been living for, 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 for a century, for more, generations. And they were, you know, they were locals. They weren't just colonists when they were, they were born there, generations. So when the civil war came and the movement, the nationalistic movement in Algeria, there were huge conflicts because these locals, right, who were French, uh, you know, they suddenly, they were natives, they were suddenly found themselves in the position of being the oppressor, and what do we do now? So this led, led to a huge crisis, and actually those, the army troops in North Algeria, in Algeria, uh, some of them actually planned to, to take power in France with a coup d'etat. This was only 50 years ago, in <coughs> 58. And that was a huge crisis. And this is when they called back the Gaulle. The Gaulle didn't want to take part in the Fourth Republic because he said, I need, he didn't like the system. Actually, nobody really cared about that system. It was an extremely fragmented parliament which created a constantly changing executive. Because all these parties, they always form different coalitions and then the government always changed. It was successful in many, many ways, actually. But when it came to a huge crisis like this, it couldn't survive because it didn't have a strong executive. But the Gaulle comes and says, I, with my prestige, will put some order into things, but we need to change the system and the political system. And he did that, and he established the so-called Fifth Republic that is today uh, actually well and alive since 1958. So that's already, what, 55 years, 56. So what sort of a system do you, do you think she established? Well, clearly one responding both to the historical heritage of France, the way France has been around, the way people understand politics there. And this is the key of un to understanding different political systems and different states is that there's no rule, right? You know, today the, the modern state is the model, but it is a model that it's, it's in, you know, it's um, implemented differently in different places based on how those human beings uh, see politics, see their history, see themselves. The federal system in the U.S. is a c concrete result of the failure of the Confederation, which was a consequence of the fact that what existed actually were colonies which declared sovereignty. That's what exi that's what existed. Right? They became states, and then they said, well, let's put some weak government and so on. Every, you know, these are political models that different areas, different communities, different groups of people, uh, you know, apply. Because you ask, you know, how should I govern myself? Well, I guess there's a state, I guess there's a government, I guess this is how I should do it, but based on what? Right? So you look at, there are different expectations about politics in different political cultures, in different countries, and you can't understand politics if you only take your own understanding, because that's just one of the many. And this is why different people in different countries have different expectations about politics, different understandings of and self-definitions. Some define themselves, their nation, nationality, based on citizenship, like Americans, we do, people who live here. Uh, some define it based on ethnicity. I'm German, nobody, no matter if I live in, you know, uh, and I was born in Ethiopia, and always live there, and German, because they speak German, it's German nationality. See, these are, you know, you need to understand uh, that the nation, the state, the political system are realities, but shaped and only understandable in a given context. And when we talk about political system, when we will talk about political parties and ideologies, you'll see how this also applies there. There's no absolute left, right, left and right depends on, on that given political culture, what are the alternatives. There is no, and by no means do they look like what it looks like here, for example. So the Gaul comes about and writes a constitution which obviously will respond to this history. What? A centralized state, strong leader, will respond to the immediate context, uh, <coughs> which is uh, of the failure of a system based on a strong parliament. So obviously the choice will not be one a system similar to the UK's, but it will be a system that is based on a strong executive. Him being, you know, the strong head of the executive. Indeed, what he will establish is what, uh, this is why we study France, in this context is a third model, we talked about presidential system, parliamentary system, this is a semi-presidential system, also called parliamentary presidential in certain books, but I prefer semi-presidential. Uh, 
So today, friends, <coughs> is, uh, let's talk about the state. So what can you tell me about the state? Unitary, federal, current federal, obviously unitary state, right? And check the definition to understand what that means. Let me go over it again. Uh, so it's a unitary state. Is it centralized or decentralized? Well, if you, were, if you would be here in class, you would probably raise your hand and say centralized, and you would be right. Obviously, centralized because that's the history, right? That's the history of accumulation of power in a central hand, right? Opposite them, for example, the US, or as you see, or as you saw, Germany, right? Or the German principalities, where it, there's a history of fragmentation, so called particularism. So, it is what? It is unitary, it is centralized. It's also huge. And here's an interesting tidbit about France, and I posted one of the maps there. Um, on the lecture file is uh, that France today has territories that are still considered to be part of its, you know, like a county in, in continental France, but are, for example, in South America. In the northeastern corner of South America, there's something called French Guiana, and there are islands around the, the, the world. And there's that map to check it. But they are like counties in France. They're not colonies, they're not territories, they are a county in France only they're considered over the seas counties. But they have the exact status because of this unitary, unitary, it's all, France is all one, understanding, yeah? So French we are, and then what's interesting about that is uh, that it means, if you didn't know, that if you want to go to the European Union, go to South America. Because French we are, in the northeastern corner of, uh, close to Brazil there, that's part of the European Union. Indeed. Um, let's go on. So that's the state. How about the political system? Well, as I said, the political system is, <coughs> we would characterize it as semi-presidential or parliamentary presidential and so on. And the name, as always, words mean things and the name tells you uh, a little bit about it. So clearly the president will play an important role. But well, here's how it looks. Um, the executive branch has a president. Yeah? So again, yeah, don't be stuck up on what it's called. It could be called a big, uh, you know, voodoo doctor. And as a matter, don't be confused by the fact that in the UK it's called the monarch and in Germany the president, because actually the German president uh, and the British monarch have the exact same functions. They're the equi each other's equivalent. You have to understand what these positions do in a system and what this system is about, uh, like. And you'll see that Germany is very similar to the, is the same political system as the UK in terms of its logic. It's both are parliamentary, only that in Germany the symbolic head of state is the president and in the UK is the monarch. So again, do not, and don't assume that all parliamentary systems have a monarch. No, but they have a state that is very just ceremonial, symbolic. But this is not the case here. Here we have a president, right? But we also have a prime minister. Hello. And a cabinet. But how does this work? Because in the UK, the prime minister was the head of uh, the executive or head of government in charge with actually running the country. In fact, the most powerful person in the country because he performed all the functions that the monarch only symbolically, symbolically did. Here, however, the president is the most important person. So the president in France is both head of state, which has all the ceremonial, symbolic meanings, just like here, right, that the president represents the country, like the monarch. The monarch represents the country signs laws. But signs laws only like, you know, it's a stamp put automatically, basically. That's what the president does here as well. Represents the country, the greatness. See, you see the role of the call, Charles de Gaulle, in, in the, because he saw himself as representing the eternal France, the glorious France, as if it would be eternal. So head of state. But president here is also head of, I will call him head of government one, which means head of executive, right? We, I told you that we're going to use uh, executive and government in this sense, uh, the similar synonyms. Head of government one means that the president is in charge with setting the grand directions of policy. He sets the direction of the country. He runs the country, right? But what does the prime minister do then? Well, he is sort of a head of government too, indeed. 
So what you have, you have a divided executive, right? In which one is both head of state and head of government, and the other one is only head of government, too. Which means that he listens to the president. We'll see how it works. So the president sets the great directions, the great policies, the prime minister basically executes. The prime minister basically <coughs> runs the day-to-day -day things in the country. He does what needs to be done. And then there's a cabinet with ministers, each of them in charge with the ministry, meaning with a branch of uh, government, uh, of policy policymaking, health, uh, foreign affairs, uh, defense, interior, uh, education, uh, whatever. Good, well let's look at the, le this is the executive, let's look at the legislature. The legislature has two houses, which is what? Bicameral, right? Unicameral, one house, bicameral, two houses. We're not dealing with any country that is unicameral, but there are plenty around the world. Um, and there's an upper house. Well, uh, let's look at these, uh, at these things. The, the lower house is directly elected, and it's called the National Assembly. National Assembly. In fact, the only two institutions directly elected in the, in the country are the President and the National Assembly. So it looks similar to the presidential model, which is the US, right? In the US as well, it's only the legislature and the President who are separately and directly elected. Well, obviously in the US, the President is not directly elected, but you know what I mean. So, what it means, what is the source of power in a democracy? It's elections. Because the whole logic of a representative democracy is that they, these institutions represent the people, that people need to have power. Well, people obviously don't have power, they, their representatives have the power that the people give them to you, them. So, power in a democracy or a system that considers itself democratic is based on legitimacy. And legitimacy is based on representation. I'm legitimate because I represent the will of the people. I'm legitimate because I represent the will of the people. When you have two institutions which are both legitimate because they represent the will of the people, they're both quasi-powerful, at least theoretically. Right? This is why it's a balanced system in the US, because the legislature has its separate mandate from the people, and the president has its separate mandate from the people. Well, let's see how it works here. In any case, the National Assembly is directly elected by the population from different districts. Uh, um, I'm not going to go into the electoral system. We will talk about later. However, note that there are several parties, not just two, in France. Because there is a different electoral system and because French political culture is much more fragmented, there are many parties. Good. Well, how about, uh, the, uh, how about the upper house? Well, the upper house is the Senate, and here's the interesting thing, what, why would France has, have an upper house, right? It's not a class-based society, we don't have a house of lords, it's not a federal state as the US, in which case the upper house would represent the states, right? When there's a bicameral system, you have to ask yourself, why bicameral, why not unicameral? Why do they need two houses? And if you ask French people, they wouldn't be able to answer you necessarily. Because it's not very clear why we need two houses of the of the of the parliament. They don't, you know, they don't really know what Senate does. Why? Because they don't vote for the Senate. But who elects the Senate? Well, actually, it is basically uh, local representatives. So let's say there's a county here, right? It's called département or department in French, in France. So let's let's say there's a department here, which is an administrative area. And in your map, you see the, the map of the department. Uh, in the video lecture map. Um, so in, each, in this department there are this many mayors, city councillors, county councillors, all these local elected representatives, plus all those representatives that they send to the National Assembly. So all the representatives that are local and sent to the National Assembly from this department, they get together and elect their representatives in the Senate for the department. So that's a, you know, in a way the Senate is represents local government or local administration. Uh, again, it's a unitary state. So it's not like these are different states with powers and whatever, so they send their own representatives, no. It's more like local administration representatives. So, <coughs> let's go back here and look at the logic of the, of, the, of, the, of the whole system, which I want you to understand. 
So the, who is the most important president of the world? He is the God, because personalities shape positions. He shaped the position of the president. He shaped politics in France. Uh, there are parties which are consider themselves, or for a long time, this was one of the main ways to define yourself politically, was to be Gaullist. To follow the Gauls' uh, way of running France, which was sort of a center-right, but also a very, in, in, um, but also a very big importance, uh, major importance, importance and role given to the state, because the state represents what? The nation, right? The France, France, right? So the Gaul gave a huge role to the state, but, but in the sense of nationalism, of supporting the glory of France and the glory of the people, and this is why the, France ha the state has to have a role in economy and everything. But he was center right, he was all for, you know, otherwise market and everything. But that's Gaulism, right? Well, just like he shaped politically Gaulism, what center right is in France was shaped by the Gaul, so is presidency shaped by uh, the Gaul. So the president, French president, is the most important, powerful actor in the French political system. He has tremendous amount of, of powers. He is head of state and head of government one, as I call him. He appoints the prime minister, who needs to be approved by the National Assembly, but he appoints the prime minister, he chooses the prime minister. He can remove the prime minister, he can remove any member of the cabinet, for example. He, he, has to, he approves the members of the cabinet. He is the one who sets the great directions of policy. He can sit in cabinet meetings, right? So then you ask, what is the prime minister doing? Well, we'll talk in a second, but, but so huge uh, roles. He's the head of the armed forces and so on and so on, the president is. So who, how is the president elected? Directed by the population. He has a five-year mandate um, and uh, Basically, there's a runoff election when you elect the president. But I'm not going to go into details about it. Just remember that he's directly elected by the uh, population. Now, uh, <coughs> okay, let's look at the prime minister. The prime minister, as I said, what's interesting about the prime minister is that, listen, in any, in any democratic system, laws are passed by the parliament, which means that you need a majority in the parliament. You need to have more than 50% of votes pass any law, right? Obviously, you have to, both houses need to pass. Now, elections give you a different composition of parliament after each election. In France, where there are many parties, after each election, the question is who will form the ruling coalition? Which parties put together, de decide to work together, obviously they do this on an ongoing base, basis and during the campaign and they know who's going to work together. But which parties have obtained enough and will work together to have 50% plus one of the seats? Why? In order to pass laws. Okay. Because you need to pass laws, this president who is very active, and by the way, the president in the semi-presidential system can introduce laws into, into the parliament. Uh, so he needs to make sure that he can work with this, with this parliament, right? Which means that the name of the prime minister, the person of the prime minister, will have to do with which parties have the majority. To, let's step back a little bit. Remember that in the UK, which is a parliamentary system, whichever party has the majority creates the executive, right? Its leader becomes PM, its members become members of government, and so on. But it's not a parliamentary system, it's a mix. So it's a, it's a meeting of a presidential system with a parliamentary system, which means that the prime minister, prime minister falls right in the middle. He, can be, he has to be appointed by, he is appointed by the, the president, but needs to be approved by the National Assembly, the majority. So this is why whoever wins here has a role in whom the president's approved appoints as prime minister. Why is this important? Because the prime minister usually it's not, I mean, it is a prestigious position, but he really is a, appointed or removed by the president, and by the way, he can be also removed by the National Assembly. He's in between these two. And usually the prime minister is just someone, if the president has a part, if the president's party's party and the coalition that supported him has the majority here, the coalition of several parties has the majority here, then Basically, he gets free hand to appoint whoever he was. And the history is that prime ministers have been appointed, you know, think of them as 
second, you know, chief operating officer. The guy, this guy appoints to run the stuff. This is why it's a secondary position. When something doesn't go well, policies don't yet work, don't work, who do you think gets removed? Do you think the president resigns? Of course not. He represents France. He simply sends the prime minister away and appoints someone else. The prime minister is sort of this joker figure <laughs> in, a, in a good sense, right? When the president has a majority in parliament. Um, because he is just the guy who runs stuff. It's more operative thing. It is prestigious. Former prime ministers have become president and, and so on. But he serves in a way at the whim of the president if he has the support of the National Assembly. However, if this majority is different from the uh, coalition that backed the president, if different parties have the majority here versus the party from which the president comes, which can happen, and it happened more often before because the president's mandate was seven years and the uh, National Assembly is five, which means that you had presidential National Assembly elections and then in five years another National Assembly while the sitting president was still in power, guess what? In National Assembly, in the new election, the majority changes, the old president is still there, you have this clash. And when the first such clash came about in the 80s, well, there's, there was a huge problem because they didn't plan for this. They didn't know what to do, what to do with it. Because until then, with the goal, the goal was about politics, just you know, name different prime ministers to do the job. But suddenly you have a situation where the president needs to work with an adversary uh, uh, national assembly. And remember, they need to approve the prime minister, and they can also remove the prime minister. And he needs to, when he pushes laws through, they will have to pass those laws. And that's when the so-called cohabitation happened. So you have you had two types of situations: unified control and cohabitation. Unified control was when both president and the majority in the National Assembly were from the same coalition of parties, same group of parties. Cohabitation is when they were from different ones. And in that case, the prime minister suddenly became more important. Suddenly, the president stepped back and became more of a head of state kind of a guy, ceremonial, perhaps more focused on, not as just symbolic like the monarch in Britain or the president in Germany, but more head of the state, more dignified, more dealing with foreign affairs and stuff like that. While the prime minister became the real engine of policy. You see? You see how this is a more dynamic system than you anticipated, perhaps? Because it depends on the balance of forces between president and national assembly. Overall, however, and especially since now, both president and national assembly are, their mandate is five years, both. And they're elected around the same time, if you've got a month difference for some reason. <coughs> it's it's, it's the, 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 the possibility of this majority being different from the one that the president comes from is not very you know, high. But it's possible still. So now unified government is more possible. But you see how the semi-presidential system, this is very important because it's very popular model, semi-presidential, because it gives you both a strong executive with independent status, more powerful than a prime minister in a way because his legitimacy does not depend on the legitimacy of the, of the parliament, although you know, the prime minister in, in Britain is hugely powerful, hugely. But it gives you both that and also an independent and representative legislature. So both an executive, efficient, uh, which you didn't have in the Fourth Republic, remember that it crumbled, and um, a representative uh, national assembly. <coughs> so that's that's the that's the logic. That is the uh, uh, dynamic of the of the of the system. As I said, laws, as in any democratic system, need to be passed by both houses. Where do laws come from? Where well, most of the laws will come from the executive. And overall, the, the logic of the system in France is that the president has most power, both constitutionally and, and in how practice has developed. And the National Assembly, you know, is much, much weaker. It's one of the weaker parliaments we have examined. Much weaker than the US Congress, much weaker than the parliament in Britain. Well, yes, let's say much weaker, although in, Parli in Britain it's obviously more complicated because uh, the executive is in many ways, uh, you know, uh, embedded, intertwined with the parliament. So to say it's weaker, it's, it's a kind of difficult. But yes, the prime minister in England, for example, can push through laws because his own party is not going to remove him, right? 
Here is a different logic. Here is both in the system, as I said, and in the practice, the present has the huge weight. This is the most important position. Unless the situation changes, as I said, and it's a dynamic. Recently, more powers have been given constitutionally to the National Assembly. What does the National Assembly do with the Senate? Debating laws, passing laws, over, having oversight of the, of the executive, things that parliaments in uh, general do. But the initiative comes from uh, here. To, uh, and let's, again, uh, finish. What does the Senate do? The Senate, uh, very briefly, when you pass laws, this is the most powerful house because it's directly elected. This is more of a house of, uh, just like the, the House of Lords, kind of just checks on, on this, on the legislation pa passed by, by the uh, National Assembly. It has, it can send it back, but the National Assembly can pass laws even against its opposition. Uh, it has power of veto only in big questions like constitutional amendment and so on. So in that, in that sense, the Senate has a power of, of veto. It's more of a house of, uh, oversight, so to speak, just like the House of Lords, stronger than the House of Lords, though, which is much, much weaker than now. So just to um, conclude, let's just look very briefly again uh, and understand that France is a centralized, but not cent it's a unitary state which means that what? There is one central government which is in Paris, that's the Paris here, and it's not outside the country, of course. And all the sovereignty is located in the central government. And if, if you go to Paris, you'll see this, because here's Paris, if you go to France. And for example, all train lines run like this. And, you know, obviously the trains are an uh, important means of transportation, not occasional. Which means that in order to go get from here to here, you have to go up to one of these transition points and come down. What I'm trying to show is that this centralization is, is really, you see, you feel it in the way in which even transportation system is, is built. Which also means that the, you will also see it in the way the country is organized. Because these, the main units being the departments, sort of counties. And the heads of the departments, guess what, are appointed from Paris. Right? Because what's a unitary state? It's a state where all sovereignty power is in the hands of the central government and it can delegate that power and can take it back. Of course, there are mayors, and there are local councils, and so on and so on, who are locally elected, and there has been some push towards decentralization, but the logic of the unitary state remains. France, then, is a semi presidential system in which the two poles are the president and the, and the parliament, especially the lower house because it's directly elected. <coughs> and that's the dynamic that you will see in every semi-presidential system, Russia, Romania, Poland, like I told you, it's very popular. Because it's always how do you balance these out? And sometimes it can lead to stalemate or catastrophe. And sometimes it's solved, because in France they have found a way to deal with the fact that when the president is from one party and the uh, majority in the uh, legislature is from another party. What you don't have, right, this is why it's semi-presidential. You don't have a separation of powers. This is why you have a PM and cabinet. You don't, this, in the US, a presidential system, you have separate powers, separate mandates. Not here. Here, the president also has a role in legislation, as you saw. He introduces legislation. Most of it comes from the executive, the president, the prime minister, the cabinet, and so on. We will list these different characteristics of different systems. Uh, you will get them from me, but you. I want you to see them in action and to see the logic of them and then when you see uh, you have these uh, lists they will make more sense hopefully and we will continue uh, tomorrow talking with uh, Germany as a model of parliamentary system.